Welcome to the Rooted Healing Podcast, where we seek to deepen our kinship with the living world and with the great mystery that runs through us. This is a space where stories heal with words that weave us closer to our wild and daring natures, bringing together the expansive minds, topics, and ideas that help us heal, reimagine, and co-create the world we wish to thrive in. I think it's one of the most important shifts that we need to see happen is a move away from assuming that we are global and we can just be wherever we want, whenever we want, to saying, find somewhere that's home, find somewhere, be there, put your roots down there and start transforming that place. Rob Hopkins is the co-founder of Transition Network and of TransitionTown.ness and the author of The Transition Handbook, The Transition Companion, The Power of Just Doing Stuff, 21 Stories of Transition, and most recently, From What Is to What If, Unleashing the Power of Imagination to Create the Future We Want. He is an Ashoka Fellow, has spoken at TED Global and at several TEDx events, and appeared in the French film phenomenon about solution-based climate change, Demain, Tomorrow, and its sequel, Après Demain. He is a keen gardener, a founder of the New Lion Brewery in Totnes, which is an example of ways to re-economise communities, and a director of Totnes Development Society, the group behind Atmos Totnes, an ambitious community-led development project, which Rob touches on in this episode. Rob hosts a brilliant podcast called From What If to What Next, where he invites imaginative thinkers to travel in a time machine to 2030 and create a visceral, tangible, innovative sense of a greener, more integrated future, where he champions collective imagination. Recent episodes explore the questions, what if imagination was treasured as a central part of childhood? What if we eradicated homelessness? What if beavers were allowed to reshape our world? Which reminds me of one of our previous episodes with Dr. Sam Gandhi, psilocybin and beavers rewilding our world, if you haven't listened to that already. Rob's work gives me so much hope, that kind of hope with its sleeves rolled up, as he says regarding Transition Network. He shows us that rapid, radical and resilient change can happen. It is possible and here are some ideas, solutions and ways to create a greener future joyfully. This seems like a brilliant episode to come out for the spring equinox because this conversation is really invoking change and new beginnings. Uh, fresh and budding look at the possible futures we have in our hands. We had our Dream Temple Spring Equinox gathering in London, which was oof, deep, profound, very medicinal experience. We'll definitely be exploring more ways to gather for sacred sleep and dreams. I'd love to quickly tell you about our ancestral gathering this summer at the foot of Erwidfa in North Wales. It is a week of ancestral crafts, foods, fireside storytelling, songs, roundhouse councils, and an embodied deep remembrance to help us explore innovative ways to re-indigenize ourselves to the land upon which we dwell, which is something Alistair McIntosh spoke to so beautifully in our episode, Crisis Calling Us to Deepen Our Humanity. And it's also along the lines of Rob's work to relocalize our systems and practices. Head to rootedhealing.org slash ancestral to learn more and to join us at the beautiful award-winning eco-dwellings at Kai Mabon. I hope you've enjoyed this inspiring, important conversation with Rob Hopkins. I was wondering, I don't know if this would be really laborious for you, but I was wondering if you could begin by sort of taking us into your time machine like you do on your podcast, From What If to What Next, and give us a little visceral taste of Totnes in 2030. So I think Totnes by 2030 oh, will have a much better established link with the land around it. The concept of the town having a food belt will be 
you can already see the beginnings of it in 2022, but I think that'll be much more established. And and then there'll be a lot of links then between the economy of the town and its different businesses and how they work and and those producers. So it'll be much more a much more sophisticated web of relationships that is built over time. Uh, by then, uh, we'll just be finishing work on the incredible um, Atmos Totnes initiative, which is was the most ambitious community-led development project uh, in the UK at the time, which has since inspired many, many others across the country. And uh, after a big community campaign and a big battle during 2022 and into 2023, the site was compulsorily purchased by the council in mid 2023, and so work then started in 2024. And it's and it's a an amazing combination of really ecological homes based on local needs for people. Because in 2022, the UK was facing a massive, massive housing emergency, and needed different ideas and different solutions. And Totnes, the Atmos Totnes project, really uh, led the way in terms of of showing a very different model. Also in 2022, when the uh, the ban on the ban on offshore wind was finally lifted by the dreadful government they had back then, uh, now means that finally the two turbines on the edge of town, which were turned down for planning permission back in about 2016, have now actually been built. So they they generate a lot of the town's electricity now, which has been amazing. And we're starting to see more and more parts of the town developing their own grids and their own systems. And the community energy company has now become something that pretty much everybody is a member of. Uh, we see a lot less cars because there's been a, a, a real upsurge in kind of community transport, but also uh, a re a re respecting of time and distance. And that actually, if you live what in 2022 you would have viewed of as being five minutes out of Totnes actually that's still quite a long way and and so a lot of people a lot more people work from home a lot more people's lives are, are more built around where they live rather than just zipping around all over the place um, and yeah we see a lot more rewilded landscapes particularly you know everybody is now following with great excitement the rewilding of Dartmoor which for many years was just like this sort of uh, blasted heath where nothing dare grow and everybody went there imagining it was some kind of a natural thing actually now it's starting the long journey towards regenerating itself as a forest and it's something that people are just obsessed with about the new creatures that have been seen there and the increase in biodiversity and it's far more interesting than any tv reality show uh, actually the sort of the return of the great forests of dartmoor uh, and I think I think the main thing is is the main difference that I see between 2022 and 2030 is that in 2022 people were kind of exhausted and broken and there was a lot of hopelessness about there was a lot of kind of individualism and a culture of well just get out we'll just get whatever you can out of it and that's now gone and what we see in 2030 is a is a it's just kind of a still a little fragile, but there is this there is this amazing kind of a, a a shared sense of adventure, like like we're setting out to discover a new world or something, and everybody has a role in it, and it feels like something incredibly historic is happening, and that they're part of it, and that they can see things changing around them. And uh, and that's that's the main thing that I bring back is that sense of of we're doing this, we're absolutely doing this, and by doing this, we feel more connected, more sort of whole than than we ever have before in our kind of living memory. Really, mm, I love that, and I love how you introduce your podcast with that, with all of your guests. And from all these different perspectives, I think it's brilliant. And I absolutely love what you're sharing around imagination and how imagination is resilient. And you asked the question, what if we considered imagination as vital to our health? So how has imagination helped you sculpt Transition Network? And 
what was your personal process because I'm thinking about this this you know this time we're in of individualization and this sort of need to be big that so many of us have what was your process to in a way I, maybe this doesn't resonate but become smaller I think uh I think at the beginning I didn't really think of transition as being an imagination project I think at the beginning it was very much a kind of what would a community-led response to the climate and ecological emergency look like? And what does it look like, look like if it starts with us here now in this place? And over the years since we started it in about 2006, there have been various different lenses that I've then, that myself and other people have then stood back and looked at it through. So some people would say, actually, it's an economic regeneration strategy. Some people would say, actually, it's a kind of... Um, personal growth community development uh, kind of inner uh, practice some people would say it's uh, it's about community building and stuff like that so it was only about three or four years ago that that for me it became I started to think about it through this lens of imagination and that what transition groups do perhaps one of the most important things that they do is to create uh, what if spaces what I call what if spaces that <clears throat> that if we are that we're living in a time where our imagination muscle which should be taught and kind of honed is is kind of flabby and uh, and really out of uh, out of shape and we need to we need to we need to rebuild that so so what do we do how do we how do we do that and I started to really look at what transition groups were doing in terms of bringing people together creating these spaces to inform and inspire people about the situation that we're in and what we can do about it, but always in the context of, so let's do something. What will we do? When do we do it? Let's meet next Saturday. You bring the spades, I'll bring the trees. Good. Okay. And, uh, and, and as I did the research for, from what is to what if it really gave me a, a, a a sense of how important it is to create spaces like that because nobody else does it governments don't do it uh, local councils very very rarely do it and often when we get invited to something that's called a consultation it's not really a consultation and we get asked to write our our, our ideas on post-it notes and then they ignore them and just do what they were going to do anyway and but can say that they've consulted mm. people that's not that's not inviting people's imagination and actually the way that transition groups facilitate those spaces and hold at that 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 space for what could we do how could we do it what would it be like and i came across this beautiful quote from the institute for the future in america that says any useful idea about the future should at first seem ridiculous which i think is so beautiful and and it's the thing that i now really encourage people whether i'm working with a company or a local government or a transition group is 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 to be ridiculous really i mean what have we got to lose at this stage any idea that someone comes up with about how we're going to tackle the climate and ecological emergency that isn't a bit ridiculous probably isn't ambitious enough you know i mean i've been around environmental stuff since since the late 80s the way that we talked about sustainability during all that time when I studied sustainability, when I was a perm teacher of permaculture, all that stuff is completely out of date now. It's not about, you know, how do we become more sustainable? It's like, this is a climate, this is an emergency mm -hmm. now, people, and the house is on fire and what are we going to do about it? And one of the only ways out of that really is through is through harnessing the imagination because we have to rebuild and we reimagine and rebuild everything. And so that's, that's for me, is why the imagination is so important to all of this. Mm, absolutely. I, I'm so on board with everything that you share and everything that you've written about in both of your books. And I think of how we're sort of perpetually spending less time outdoors and less time in play. And I think of education systems. I just think of the youth. I've got several nephews and nieces and I've worked in education briefly and just witnessing play become smaller and therefore the imagination becoming smaller. And this is something you've spoken a lot about. And I just would love to hear some reflections and thoughts on projects around street play, taking risks. Um, yeah, just maybe creating more space for the arts, anything that you want to flow with. Yeah, I, I, I feel like um, I just read a book where he said something like, you know, we're, we're only going to 
we're only going to win this if this is the best party in town. Mm. The idea that we're going to mobilise a movement on a historic size and scale, but it's going to feel like a long walk home in the rain on a cold November Thursday, it's just not going to happen. You know, this has to feel like... Uh, just delightful and 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 exciting and exhilarating and um you know we talked about the time machine earlier on i'm doing a project at the moment which is called field recordings from the future which is where we're making music based on field recordings of places that i go and visit which already sound like that future needs to sound like mm. and so and we're making a video for one of the for one of the tracks of that and so we were thinking about okay so if you did have a time machine and you could travel to 2030 what would be the rules? You know, there's what's the pro what's a time traveler's protocol, right? Because I'll be like, if you go back in time, obviously you can't kill people because you would, and you know, you can't, you can't, you can't sleep with people because you would completely change the, you know, you can't bring a disease from the future into the past. So there are certain things you, so one of the things we were thinking about traveling to the future is that. Uh, you know, obviously you can't kill anybody, you can't do anything like that, but also you can't kind of bum people out with 2022 cynicism mm. because if actually you get to that 2030 and there is now this collective sense of, do, do you know what? I think we might do this, mm -hmm. actually. You know, the last thing you need is to kind of pollute that with sort of 2022 sort of, yeah, right, kind of uh, yes, but sort of energy. You know, you, it needs to be... Uh, you can only go into it with that kind of yes and energy which comes from from doing improv. So when I do workshops and things with people who usually come to it with their imagination kind of a bit suffocated, a bit atrophied, the first thing I always do with them is I in the instructions they get before they come, they get asked to bring a potato. So they're thinking, why is... Why has Rob Hopkins asked us to bring a potato? So then when they arrive, I put them into groups of five or six and I give them uh, uh, and I give them a handful of cocktail sticks and I say, combining your potatoes, <clears throat> you've got 25 minutes and I want you back here with a creature that you've made. You can go outside, you can add anything to it you like, anything that you find. I want a creature and I want to know its name, I want to know what it eats, and I want to know its mating call. Go. <laughs> and people just go off, and they just giggle. They, you just hear them going around in groups for like 25 minutes, just go, oh, like like kids when you ask them to do something like that. Yeah. And they just giggle, and they come back with some ridiculous uh, creature. And what I love about it is, is it's such a great way to get adults into a playful headspace. Because even if you're the most sort of uptight perfectionist engineer type accountant or something you can't make anything with potatoes that isn't ridiculous <laughs> however hard you try you actually just make it more ridiculous and you just have to go with this is going to be silly let's do something silly and uh and and, and i f i feel like there's that there's such magic that you find in that when you get people into that yes and space and i always do it in talks we do three we do that thing that i learned doing improv about yes and and mm. it's so beautiful when you have a whole room full of people doing yes and with each other so uh, i always say to people you know you're planning a picnic with your partner and you're taking it in turns to make suggestions and in the first round you just you just shut their idea down with negativity the second round you accept it but with no enthusiasm but in the third one you build off each other's ideas so oh we could uh I'll bring some champagne. Yeah, we could uh, open a uh, we could open a champagne bar by the lake. Yes, and we could and we could ask Elton John to come and play his piano. Yes, and we could do a big firework. You, you know, and you create some ridiculous thing. I think when I look around the room when people are doing that, the room fills up with kind of laughter and bright eyes and connection and and I always say to people, that's what this needs to feel like. Mm. Like put it in a bottle and take it home so you've got it when you need it because that's that's what this that's what this needs to feel like and it's why we need to bring that culture of play back into what we do. Yeah, I love that. I run retreats and I'm always running an inner child workshop where I get everyone to play. And I think Great. it's so 
brilliant how just everyone lights up and it completely changes the energy I think play is medicine in a way and it's a big solution or an aid to it to our solution so I love I love that potato idea I <laughs> I really enjoy that I'm, I'm intrigued by by this notion of smallness you know you said um small is inevitable and in, in in terms of this sort of petroleum interval that you've called it mm. and you've quoted Einstein in the transition handbook uh, any intelligent fool can make things bigger, more complex and more violent. It takes a touch of genius and a lot of courage to move in the opposite direction. <laughs> and I think this is a really big topic for people in my echo chamber because I just, I witness and I witness it within myself a need to keep going at a pace that feels expansive, that feels um, like there's opportunities and there's movement and there's a need for cultivating our you know our offering our service whatever it is but to actually go in the opposite direction and to go smaller and to be more localized that I think for a generation that have been so beyond that like I don't it's it's yeah that counter direction I just would love to hear your thoughts on this notion of smallness how does that feel for you I think you know when you talked about the the petroleum interval it's I it's 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 something which which I when I first heard that I found really powerful that idea that when you when you pan back historically and you look at the time that we're living in in its bigger context you know in the same way that we look at the way that empires rise and fall through history or different eras or whatever a petroleum interval is basically a kind of 200 year period where we suck this extraordinary material out from beneath our feet and burnt it all. And, uh, and yes, of course, it brought many amazing benefits, but it also very, very potentially, unless we see something extraordinary happen, finished us off. <laughs> you know, the, the United Nations said recently, about two weeks ago, before we recorded this podcast, they published a report where they said, you know, that any chance of staying below one and a half degrees is now completely off the table, unless we see a rapid transformation of society. So all the headlines led with 1.5 degrees is now finished. We, you know, humanity, that's now not going to happen. No headlines said, hey, why don't we do that rapid transformation of society thing? Mm. Wouldn't that be good? Let's do a rapid transformation of society. And for me, that rapid transformation of society can only be one where we move away from economic globalization and the idea that it's somehow acceptable to grow apples in the UK and then fly them to South Africa to be waxed and to bring them back here and sell them as local apples or that the UK exported before Brexit the same amount of potatoes to Germany as it imported from Germany and the same amount of butter to the Netherlands as we imported from the Netherlands. And Herman Daly, the economist, once beautifully said, why don't we just email each other the recipes? You know, <laughs> and and I th I feel like we need to be every step that we can take towards meeting more of our needs closer to where we are mm -hmm. is a good thing to do. It's not sometimes people then dismiss it and say, oh, what you're saying, you want Devon to be completely self-sufficient in food or London to be self-sufficient in food. That's never going to happen. And it's never really happened throughout history. But every step we can take towards that is a huge potential for uh, uh local money to support local investment uh, to build an economy which is much more democratically accountable to, to to make us much more connected to the impact of what we do and how our food is produced and there are amazing projects like in Liège now where they they're creating this food belt around the city of Liège which is transforming how the economy works there how the city thinks about itself how it identifies itself it's just phenomenal and and I think you know when you talked about young people and this uh and this challenge it's one of the things that always interests me whenever i go into universities or business colleges and speak there is still this sort of belief that uh that a lot of young people have which is that they feel completely global 
So they feel like, well, you know, I'm going to go and do an internship in New York and then my friend's getting married in Thailand and mm. then I'm going to go and do a retreat in, uh, in, in, in Holland and then I've got to go and uh, visit my girlfriend in Sao Paulo. Just like, you can't, do, we can't do that anymore. You know, I would say to people, it's like in, in Europe, in the UK, our average carbon footprint is about 13 tons a year Mm. it needs to get down to about three and that needs to happen by the end of the decade if you fly to new york and back that's about two tons of co2 it's like you can't it doesn't fit anymore Mm. we can't you you don't you do not have that level of privilege where you can keep flying because it's uh there are very few people in the world who actually ever get to go on an airplane and the idea that it's somehow you're entitled to it you know, I stopped flying in 2006 because I sat down and thought about it. And I thought, well, if we're going to get down to being a family where we're all like sort of two tons of CO2 each, the flying's got to go. The meat's got the beef, the, 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 the meat's got to go. You know, we can't, we, we can't keep believing that we can negotiate with physics. Mm. So, so for me, this idea of, of smaller, it doesn't mean that we become less impactful. David Fleming, who was an amazing economist and, and friend of mine, he used to say, people talk all the time about how we need a silver bullet. He said, we don't, we're not looking for silver bullet. We're looking for silver buckshot. It's like lots and lots of small solutions that cumulatively have the kind of impact that we need. So, uh, so I, I, I think it's one of the most important shifts that we need to see happen is a move away from assuming that we are global and we can just be wherever we want, whenever we want, mm. to saying, find somewhere that's home. Yeah. Find somewhere, be there, put your roots down there mm. and dedicate. And, you know, and I, and I'm, I appreciate within the context of the migration uh, challenges that many people have there's an element of privilege in saying that but mm. but it, but for those who can find a place put your roots down and start transforming that place yeah. and don't assume you know I'm I'm aware that I will never go to Australia and I will never go to America but I'm okay with that because actually the challenge is is bigger and I'm aware that I know parts of Delhi better than I know Manchester or better than I know lots of places that I can get to very easily on the train, mm. parts of Wales, you know. So it's like, come home. Yeah. Come home and, and, and be there and transform that place rather than just assuming that somehow the world owes you uh, flying around everywhere, trashing it. No, those are really important words. And I can just speak from my echo chamber of of people in the well-being industry who are international teachers and are moving all over the world all the time. And I've, you know, I lived in Mexico for a year and I've really tackled with this internal conflict. But now it's just so clear for the past year that I, I need that I needed to come home and I needed to put my roots in. Mm. And a lot of my friends say, um, oh, well, but our our one seat on a plane will never come close to these people going around in their private jets and their and there's this kind of measurability with these elite people who are of course very hateable <laughs> as a sort of justification and that's where this question of personal um commitments to the world we want to create versus the comparison measurability with the with the people who are really yeah. yeah. It's that it's that it's what people call what aboutism, you know. It's 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 that you can kind of justify what you're doing by saying, Yeah, but what about them? You know, and I, I remember a few years ago talking to somebody who who was doing a course that I was teaching actually and she said, oh, I won't be here next week because uh I'm flying to New Mexico to do an earth wisdom retreat. And mm. I just remember being struck by this kind of but just a, a sort of irony overload. What you you've got to fly to New Mexico to do an earth wisdom like what kind of wisdom is that yeah. like you're 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 going to put like six tons of co2 mm. into the atmosphere for something you could have done here with probably taught by a teacher from here who could just as easily have done it here mm. and you're going to new mexico it's like what are you doing and and in that kind of well-being sort of spiritual thing of people flying all around the world you know i i feel like uh in my own work I wouldn't book somebody, I would no longer book somebody 
to run a workshop or to speak a conference if I knew they had to fly to get there. Yeah. You know, like in in I, I a few years ago I got in I got rung up by a, an organization in San Francisco who said uh, you're a finalist in our in our in our design awards. You know, we see what you're doing as a kind of a design thing and we need you to come to San Francisco for the for the um for the design award fi- finals and I said, well, I don't fly and they said, oh, but you're a finalist in our <laughs> in, in our design awards. I said, and what is it that you're giving me that award for? And they said, well, the the work you've done on around, around climate change. I said, exactly. So don't you think it would be insane for me to fly in order to pick up an award for that? So they said, are you sure? And I said, yes. And then they said, we'll call you back. And the next week they rang and said, all of our finalists will be presenting by Zoom. And they completely redesigned the whole event. Oh, so somewhere out there, there shivers. were three people who were who were furious with me because they were going to get <laughs> a free flight to San Francisco. But you know, now if I get asked to speak in a conference in in Singapore or or Australia, I don't go. I record it on Zoom. I start by telling everybody how much CO two I've saved by not flying, and often that gets a round of applause. And I think we have to be real about this now. It's not acceptable anymore. You can't, we cannot do that anymore. Mm. And and actually, if what we're about, what people are about is about personal growth and spiritual development and connecting people with that, you can do that so much more powerfully by staying where you are and connecting people to that place and encouraging people to build that relationship and actually, you know, living, living, yeah, I don't know. It's it's yeah. like, yeah, the, the, like there's there's no well being industry on a dead planet. There's no well being on a dead planet. There's no nothing on a dead planet. And uh, just because you burn carbon in the pursuit of personal growth, it's still carbon molecules in the atmosphere. And uh, you know, in the same way that lots of people who teach that kind of thing are having to integrate and learn about uh decolonization and race mm. and gender and all of these uh, uh increasingly to put those things as central to the work that they do this has to be there too this absolutely yeah. has to be there too oh i'm so glad you've spoken to that i yeah it needs to be said and i don't think it's being said enough and they're... i'm always happy to say it <laughs> <laughs> well yeah i'm sort of thinking of this yeah rooting down and this has been such an important topic for me. I mean, obviously, I called my whole thing rooted healing. <laughs> um, and I think of community and I think of an overwhelming loss of a sense of belonging. And I, I'm sure you've said something along these lines, and I've definitely heard Sharon Blackie talk about this, how it's our responsibility to cultivate belonging. It's up to us. And and I just, you know, everything that you've been doing, Transition Network and all the projects that have been unfolding from that place and probably a lot of challenges when it comes to community resilience and conflict resilience. So I just love to hear your thoughts on, I guess, the different mentality, the different sensation of what it means to be acting and living as part of a community and actually cultivating your own sense of belonging. I mean, I I feel like the the oil age uh, the petroleum interval to come back to that and and cheap energy has allowed us and now the kind of social like the the the, the internet and the digital revolution has allowed us to embrace a much bigger idea of of what community is you know like if if like me you're interested in some completely obscure band that only about five other people in the world have ever even heard of the internet allows you to feel like you're part of a community of all like these these five people uh who and 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 obviously you know for a lot of people for people who are very isolated uh that's been a very powerful thing but i think at the same time for me ultimately community is the people who'll come around and help if your roof gets blown off in a storm. Mm. You know, during COVID, we really saw who our community is, you know, the people who'll check that you're doing all right. And, um, and community is something that, that is always there, but it needs, 
don't, infrastructure isn't the right word. It's like if you want to make a new coral reef, for example, you don't make a coral reef by breeding loads of coral in a tank and sort of letting it swim off into the sea or whatever it does. Actually, what you do is you put in place stuff that the coral can form around. So often they put in old cars in a particular sort of shape and then the coral form on that and then that's how you make a new coral reef. So community needs things to to kind of come together around. So that used to be the church. It used to be certain festivals at certain times. A lot of that stuff has really gone out of people's lives. So we need to be creating those. It's what I see in the transition movement all the time is people creating projects and places and events and uh, and things where people can come together we did a one of the things that we did in totnes in uh about 2013 and they're just doing a new version of it now was called transition streets and the idea of that was that you form groups of neighbors on your street between six and ten households you meet in each other's houses seven times the first meeting you do, you get support with and you have a workbook and you look at energy one week, water the next week, and then you make changes. And 550 households took part uh, in Totnes. And on average, they cut their carbon footprint by 1.3 tonnes each. So they saved themselves about £600 a year. What was fascinating, though, afterwards was when they were surveyed about it, was no one mentioned the carbon or the money. Everyone said, I know my neighbours better. I feel connected to where I am. When COVID arrived, those kind of WhatsApp groups that they had made around that became fundamentally important to how those communities then self-organized in order to protect, in order to support each other. So so for me, that that's the thing of always thinking, how do we how do we put in place the infrastructure so that community has something to come together around? Mm. And um you know, I'm involved in a project which I mentioned in my trip to 2030, this, the Atmos project in Totnes, which I've been involved with for a long time, and which we're in a big battle now to get the site back off some deeply unscrupulous developer types. And and that's been so, so interesting that the work we've done over the last 10, 15 years around all, a lot of the consultations and the public meetings and building a community around that who feel like this is our thing, this is our thing. Recently, the developer put in a planning application for the for just a dreadful development mm. on that site. They got twenty three letters of support, and it looks like it's going to be almost a thousand letters of objection. And it's 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 when you build that community, you can you can you know it's it's there, and and when you build the right things, people come to it. So so for me, it's 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 community is is a place based thing and obviously we share stuff the transition movement was always the idea was well i don't know how to do this and i don't know how to do it in my town but if enough people in different places are trying to figure it out and sharing their learnings then maybe we can get a handle on it so so as much as anything it's a movement of stories and people sharing their stories it's a community of it's a community of communities Mm. you know it's not a community of just sort of ideas and philosophy and 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 thinkers it's it's people someone once called transition hope with its sleeves rolled up which mm. i really like and and i think when you have a network of people who are doing that at the community scale but sharing their learnings then maybe that's one way that we might start to 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 figure this out yeah that resonates so deeply i'd love to hear more about atmos especially as someone from a generation where we are really affected by this housing crisis and we clearly need radical solutions on how to live and how to create community and how to localize so the idea is it's it's an eight acre former milk factory in the middle of totnes it was the biggest employer in the town until uh 2007 160 jobs were lost when it closed and then we started a campaign for the community to become the developer and uh and it's been an amazing journey where the where the community ran a consultation in a town of 9000 people heard ideas from more than 4000 people master planned the site based on the community's needs with 62 truly affordable homes so homes that people can rent based on what benefits would support uh, a new music and arts venue in a listed building uh, a, a hotel that runs in partnership with the local college as a kind of a training hotel, 7,000 square metres of new workspace, 
uh, a school for food entrepreneurs as a sort of incubator for new food businesses and lots of other stuff. So it was this, so the design came out of the consultation, the elements came out of the consultation that went through a series of rounds and then using a, a thing that the government had created at the time called a community right to build order, we, uh, we then got planning permission through a referendum. So we had a referendum in Totnes and 86% of people who voted, voted for it to go ahead. Mm. Uh, and then we were held up through various things beyond our control to do with the company who owned it. And then just as we were about to sign the final contracts to buy it, they told us they'd sold it to a private company instead. Wow. And we now know through some outrageous nepotism that the guy who basically bought the site was the brother-in-law of the guy who was the chief operating officer who we were negotiating with at the company, Saputo Dairy UK. It was just outrageous nepotistic gazumping of the project so we've then since been campaigning for the last two and a half years to get the site back again and we're building up to creating a situation where the where, where the district council have to use their powers of compulsory purchase and buy the site back so that Amos can go ahead so so that will hopefully happen next year and it's looking very positive we're just about to resubmit our plans for um for for our scheme and one of the things that's most important about it and why it's such a transformative thing and why i've given 14 years of my life to this thing Mm. is that it'll all be in community ownership so at the moment what happens is a developer buys an old site like that and they knock everything down and they design something that will maximize their profit from it and then they'll build it and then they'll profit take the money and the money will leave Totnes and then it's gone with the with with our model it's built by the community for the community so uh, so it borrows money over a longer period of time, maybe 25, 30 years. In 30 years' time, it's paid all that off, and it's generating two, three million pounds a year from all the rents, from the housing, from the different office space, all the different stuff. So every year, the community has two or three million quid to decide what it wants to do with. It's like how I keep saying to people, how transformative would our approach to COVID, to climate change, have been if someone had done that 25, 30 years ago? Yeah. And if we now were to do that and that became the model across the country, then you start to really give communities power over what happens rather than development just being something that's done to them rather than done by them. Uh, yeah. So watch this space, atmostotness.org. It's going to get very interesting in the next 12 months, I think. Wow. Yes. Yeah, such an amazing project. I really hope it pulls through and that we can use it across the UK. You've done a lot with this whole notion of re-economy with Transition Network and especially in Totnes. Can you share a little bit more about the various uh, approaches to localising economy? Yeah, so so for the first few years when the transition movement started, it was very much kind of, let's do things that are good for the climate and good for people and and then after a few years, we we realised that unless this was creating jobs for people, it was really not going to be much use. That that this needed to create work for people to really be meaningful. Mm. So we uh, so we started a thing called the Reconomy Project because if if we imagine that we're going to change things at the speed we need to, and we're going to do it with volunteers who meet one Wednesday every month. We're kidding ourselves. And also, if we imagine it's going to be done by volunteers, you're going to end up with a pretty much exclusively white middle class movement because mm. those are the people who have the time and kind of the confidence to volunteer for something like that. Mm. So we need to be creating jobs for people. And when you look at it through a, a an entrepreneur's way of thinking, there's so many things that need to be done how do we do it and create work for people? One of the projects I'm involved with in Totnes is called the New Lion Brewery. And we're uh, the, one of the first 100% community-owned breweries in the country. We have 270 owners. And and that's, that's, that's the model that, that we do. And we could have approached it and said, yeah, we're going to do a kind of volunteer community brewing thing and get together and then share the brewery, around, the beer around. Actually, there's like six or seven people who can pay their mortgage and feed their kids and that's really really important so how when we're thinking of what we need to do do we approach it with a with that kind of entrepreneur's brain 
of how do we create jobs out of this. So in Totnes, we have a place called the Reconomy Center, which is a, a kind of an incubator place for new economy businesses. People come with an idea and they get support to make it a, a reality. And then every year we do this fantastic event called the, the, the Local Entrepreneurs Forum. And at that event, you get four or five people who come along and present their ideas and um uh and rather than presenting it to like a single investor or like so on the dragon's den on the tv right you get people who present to these like millionaires sitting on a stage with their money and try and get the money out of them mm -hmm. this is like a community of dragons so everyone's a dragon and the idea is how how can you support these people it could be that you're investing money could be that you're helping them with a business plan could be that you're giving them a space to work from could be that you help them with their accounts or designing a website or offer to babysit the kids while they go and see the bank manager or give them a massage or make them some nice food or whatever it is it's like community supported business incubation and we've done it now for i think 10 years and there's about 40 businesses that exist because of it and a real network between all of those businesses that have come through that process and it's my favorite event of the year it's really kind of optimistic and joyful and celebratory um <clears throat> yeah and there's lots of other places now where this concept of reconomy has gone to and places that have their own version of of the reconomy idea but it's basically this stuff needs to create jobs for people how do we create jobs for people that's really the best way to do it yeah, and you don't don't you also have an, your actual own currency that you've used? Yeah, we did have we did have until just before COVID. We had the Totnes pound, which was a local currency that we started in two thousand and seven. So it ran for yeah, it ran for about nine, eleven years, I think. And we at the beginning we just had a one pound note because I walked into a, a building uh, where my friend had a film production company in Totnes, which used to be the bank. And on the wall, he had a framed 1810 one pound note issued by the Bank of Totnes. And I thought, wow, what would happen if we made some some new ones? And uh, <clears throat> and I asked various people who were kind of learned alternative economist people. And they all said, D I don't know, really. Uh, try it and see. And so we did, and we printed 300 of these one pound notes that were like a facsimile of the 1810 ones, which are now very collectible and valuable things. I wish I'd kept a few more of them. And, uh, and then there were, there was about 20 shops that would accept them as being worth a pound. And we ran that as an experiment for three months just to see what happened. And people really liked it. So then we printed new one pound notes. So for a little while, we just had one pound notes. And then I think in about 2015, we printed this beautiful set of notes with a one, a five, a 10 and a 21 pound note because people would say, why have you got a 21 pound note? Or we could say, well, why not? We, <laughs> we'll do whatever we like. Thank you very much. And so we stopped it in 2019 just because we noticed that people weren't using cash of any kind anymore. It was, mm. was a real decline of people using cash and we didn't want it to just sort of whimper out and disappear. We wanted to celebrate it. So we did a big event that's called, uh, was called, the life and celebrating the life and times of the Totnes pound. But what's really interesting is that is that the model has been taken and adapted a little bit. And there are now 82 local currencies in France, most different areas. And, and it's similar, but they have a slightly different model. A lot of them heard about it through a French film called Tomorrow that came out in 2015, which included mm -hmm. me with a, holding up this 21 pound note and talking about why we have a 21 pound note. So loads of the places that, that I go to that have local currency, they have de denominations like I went to one place recently that had a 54 note. One place had a 43. There's one, the currency in Avignon called La Rue. They have a 13 uh, note and it often links in with something about their history or their story or mm -hmm. which department they are in France or whatever. And even in uh, in Liège in France in Belgium, they have a uh, they have a zero note. And I said, why have you got a zero note? And they said, well, because, you know, sometimes someone does something nice for you and you want to show them some appreciation, but you don't want to put a number on it because that feels a bit weird and a bit kind of mercenary. Uh, so I just I love that kind of creativity that it's yeah. created. The, the idea of it is really how do you get money to stay locally mm. rather than drifting off to other places? So 
the Bristol Pound, which was one of the bigger UK experiments, they had on their notes in very small writing, keeping money out of the Cayman Islands since 2012, which I really, really loved. Because that's the point. You know, you can't take Bristol Pounds anywhere. out. You've taken them to Bath, they're not worth anything. Take them to Swindon, they're not worth anything. But in Bristol, they have value and they circulate. And that's really what we want money to do. And you can do that without a local currency, but a local currency is one really powerful uh, tool for helping with that. I love it. I, because I'm such a uh, uh, kinetic or visual learner, uh, I think it, th- this sort of very physical, tactile ability to localize and empower our, within our community, I think is very powerful and on much deeper levels. So this is mm. wonderful. So I guess just to finish, um, you know, for anyone who's listening, thinking, oh my goodness, how do I not know about this? What can I do <laughs> to transition my local area in any of these kind of ways? What would you send them to do? I would say, uh, welcome to the future. Uh, I would say, if you go to transitionnetwork.org, there's a bit at the top that says transition near me. And if you type in your postcode, it'll tell you what the groups are and the activities that are happening where you are. If you then scroll down to the bottom of that page, there's a link to a free download called The Essential Guide to Doing Transition, which is our kind of distilled experience of everything that we've learned of what works and what doesn't work. And so download that, have a read. You may find there's already a group start running where you are, get involved. If not, you can start one. It's really straightforward. Um, if you're listening to this outside the UK, there's like 26 countries, I think, now that have a national transition, what we call a hub, a national transition organization who would be doing the same kind of role where you are. Um, the other thing I would say to people is it's so, so easy to just be um, drowned in eco-anxiety mm. and feeling grim about what's happening because we just often we set up our kind of social media feeds and the channels by which stuff come to us so that we just get this kind of relentless tide of this so do follow some accounts like transition together we are possible positive news because there is so much happening out there in the world and so many people doing so many great things i retweet a lot of that stuff if you're on twitter i'm robin transition um you know, so I try and share out as much of that stuff as I can because there is a huge amount happening, but all we hear is the is the bad news. So, I guess the last thing I would say is like Extinction Rebellion say, um, we are all crew. You know, don't be a bystander. And whatever it is that you do, how can you, how can you, uh, or reorient that mm. to being part of this? So if you do. If you are somebody who trains in personal development stuff, if you teach movement, meditation, yoga, whatever it is, we need that. We need you too, <clears throat> you know, but we we need you to be modeling a different way. And, and one of the things that came out of Extinction Rebellion was a whole bunch of different approaches like uh, music declares, people in the music industry declaring a climate and ecological emergency and saying we need to do things in a very different way. So... You have bands like Massive Attack saying, we'll only tour now if we can tour on the train. Mm. Um, you have all of, you know, people really rethinking what does that mean? Culture declares, which is lots of the theatres in the UK declaring a climate emergency, looking at, well, how do we do this in a different way? You've got law declares, architecture declares, writers declare. You've got all of these different things. I'd love to see a kind of, you know, I don't, what would it be like personal development or mind body spirit declares yeah because we need you to yeah and we need you to really reimagine what you're doing in this context and to see the huge huge opportunities of that yeah. you know a lot, a lot of people now talk about being inspired by indigenous wisdom and you know teaching of this kind of those people didn't fly around the world. You know, the whole point of that wisdom was it came from a place. Yeah. It came from a soil. It came from an ecosystem. It came from the web of relationships that, that were there. Well, we, we, the fact that we would have had that tradition and it got destroyed by the witch trials and it got destroyed by, by Christianity uh, and so on and so on doesn't mean that we can't be kind of creating that here. We don't need to become like sort of global yeah. 
yeah. spiritual kind of uh, eco tourist consumers. We need to be creating something that is that that is responsible. And I would really also suggest that people look into the into what we call inner transition. There's lots of resources on the Transition Network website. There's a brilliant book by Anthea Lawson called The Entangled Activist, which includes a lot of that. There's a guy called uh, Vincent Watelet in Belgium who just has a book on inner transition coming out soon, which is all about how do we use those tools from personal growth, personal development, eco-psychology, uh, eco-feminism. Mm -hmm. How do we use all those tools to support the transition that has to happen. Yeah. And for me, that's some of the most interesting and exciting work that's going on in this kind of uh, space. Amazing. Oh, these are words so needed in the space and I'm really excited to hear all the feedback from this episode. I, yeah, <laughs> I really am. Thank you so much, Rob. My pleasure, my total pleasure. Thank you for, for inviting me on. Thank you for being here with the Rooted Healing community. You can find the Transition Network and Rob's work through the links in the show notes. Through deepened imagination, consciousness expansion and cross-cultural wisdom exchange, we explore human to nature ecology to ignite collective healing, awe and interconnectivity. We offer nature immersive ceremonial gatherings, legal and safe psychedelic assisted psilocybin retreats, integrative healing courses and a growing collection of resources rooted in regenerative reciprocity. Visit rootedhealing.org to learn more. Please consider joining our Patreon community where you can gift forward and support our work in exchange for bonus material, book and gift giveaways, meditations, workshops, episode transcripts, community discussion and discounts to our events. Your monthly contribution, which can be as little as £3 a month, helps us cover the costs of running the show and our hope is to gather enough abundant gifters to afford professional audio production so that we can free up more time Time to focus on gathering together in person, which is the heartbeat of our work. Our patron has a rich archive of resources to support you, which you gain immediate access to when signing up. Come follow us on Instagram at Rooted Healing Co. or find us on the various platforms you tune into. And don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe to the show if these stories and conversations are resonating with you. It's a beautiful, simple act of reciprocity to make those couple of clicks and help others discover our work. Thank you, Mike Howe and Chris Park, for your ongoing music contributions. And thank you so much, everyone who's been donating your music and your creations um, for our upcoming episodes and our new season very excited to announce that soon what it's going to be focused on and the wonderful guests that we have coming onto the show thank you so much for being here i'm your host veronica stanwell thanks for listening